we are again looking at old Hemfield Township. Even though the story we're telling is about pre-railroad Hemfield Township, that's uh, before 1850. If we look at this map, you can see that we're looking at an older or a newer map. You can see the railroad is coming through here. Uh, that was finished in 1852, and this mapping is from the 1860s, but I like to use it because it, it's good and descriptive, it's clean, it's not as thorough and exact as I would like, but it's, it's good enough to uh, get a basic picture. In the year 1810, we're looking at a uh, fairly sparsely populated place. In 1810, there were 3,444 people counted. And Greensburg itself was, you know, only several hundred people at that point. Uh, we look back at the time of the uh, Whiskey Rebellion because we're talking about the things people made and in those early days, one of the more important things was the whiskey that they made, the distilled spirits. And it's a note of just how important it was to the people then because they were willing to face up to, and some people with arms, come against the federal government because the uh, distilled spirits were a very important economic item for them. They could sell it to make some money when might, money was very scarce at that point. We're looking at a time during the Whiskey Rebellion when there was about, you could count in the township about 16 stills. That was the legal ones. The ones that were, uh, you know, that the people would come forth and admit to having. But in addition to that, there were probably 30, 40, 50 stills. Nobody really knows uh, because it was a very important uh, money producer. At a time when money was scarce, uh, the uh, whiskey was uh, something that was almost or sometimes better than the money they had then. This recalls the old days when the uh, Little Brown Jug was simply a household item. Now these things are for us a uh, curiosity, a knick-knack to have around the house. but. Back then, these things were uh, standard equipment. And I might mention, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote George Dallas Albert again because his comments give a bit of insight into a period of time where we're very far away from. And he was in contact with the people from the early, uh, the early 1800s. He was born in 1846 and published his history before he was 40. But I quote from his history because it gives us some insight into the importance or prevalence of distilled spirits in the early, uh, the early times, the early township. There was a time, and I quote here, there was a time in the early history of southwestern Pennsylvania when whiskey was the one commodity that had a standard value and all the mediums of barter and exchange such as corn, salt, tobacco, etc., were valued in accordance with the amount of whiskey they would fetch. Old rye whiskey was exchanged at the grocery for tea, coffee, household utensils, and farming implements. At all public gatherings, it was gurgled copiously from all sorts of jugs and was guzzled by all sorts of men, women, and children. That's from page 171. Of Albert's history. And I might mention that uh, in the newspaper ads in the early uh, 1800s, you can look at the early ads in the Greensburg papers, and they would often say, the local merchants would say very plainly, that uh, country produce was acceptable in exchange for goods. In other words, they would, they would uh, be very happy to you know, take whatever the farmers could produce and exchange it for what they were selling. And probably one of the most acceptable items was your whiskey.
Now this recalls a leftover from the uh, from the times of the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, John Wells, whose ad this is here, John Wells and his father Benjamin had been the excise collectors at the time of the Whiskey Rebellion in the, in the mid-1790s. And you can bet they were not very popular people then. Uh, but what you can see is that by 1801, Wells had a store and an office on Main Street, Northern Main Street, up by Tunnel Street, and was uh, telling people to come and uh, buy their certificates that they needed to pay the, pay the tax on their whiskey. And even then, just by the way he words this, it seems like he was uh, still a rather standoff, standoffish type. If he had had that office in the mid-1790s, he probably would have had it burnt down, but you can tell things have calmed down by that point. Uh, we're, we're going down here, looking at mills in the township, even though you see part of the town, down here on Jack's Run, this was just beyond the town limits, and down here along Jack's Run was where Christopher Truby had his mill. Uh, he sold it to his son Michael before he died, Christopher Truby, one of the founders of the town, died in 1802. And by 1808, his son Michael owned it. And he was uh, claiming 140 acres. And at tax lists, he said he owned a sawmill and a distillery. He had a still. Uh, and at this point, I see we're at point at time almost, so we should... Shut down and say so long until next time.